sins every day. I, I'm sitting next to my girlfriend and we're not married. We fool around Cliff. I'm not proud of it, but we do. We sin. My name is Eddie Ruiz and I exist to help you sharpen your biblical mindsets to love God and love others well. Welcome to part two of the conversation between George Janko and Cliff Nectel as we unpack a bunch of the biblical insights within the conversation that we can apply to our life. And just as a reminder, we're not here to hate anybody in the video or judge anybody for what they're saying or what they're believing. We're here to expand on the biblical insights to learn more and apply them to our daily life. So let's go ahead and jump right into the video. Another question I wanted to ask you is, what is it that truly brings a man into heaven? I grew up believing that mm. you have to be uh, baptized to go into heaven. Um, and I want to get into baptism a little bit because it's something that kind of like freaks me out. Uh, because I was baptized when I was a, when I was a baby. Mm. And when I read the scripture, from my POV of what baptism is, I, it's like an engagement like a proposal. I really like that George is like letting his gears turn as he's having this conversation. He's digging in deep to his childhood and the way that he was raised and his understanding of what gets you into heaven. But the illustration of baptism being a proposal is kind of backwards because the proposal actually came when Jesus resurrected from the grave and gave us a path to eternity with him, a direct path to God. That's really the proposal that we are to accept or deny. Here's the truth about biblical baptism. It's an outward expression of an inward transformation. Baptism does not save us. And it's really important to understand that because there are denominations out there that believe that once you're saved by faith, you have to get baptism in order to complete that salvation. But that's biblically inconsistent and it's just biblically untrue. And with regards to baptism being an outward expression of an inward transformation, Romans 6 says it like this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Clearly, when we're baptized and immersed in water, we're not gonna be immersed into death. Like the pastor's not gonna hold us down until we meet Jesus face to face. The reality is what Paul is saying is there that is that when we're baptized, we are buried in the likeness of his death and that when we come back up, we're raised to life like he was from the grave to walk in the newness of life. We don't die in baptism and then we're not raised or resurrected back to life physically. It's an outward expression of what Christ has done with us and we align with his death and resurrection as a way of saying, listen, I have followed Jesus and this is the way that I'm expressing it through baptism. And even to take it a step further in Ephesians chapter four, when Paul is talking about bringing unity to the church, he says, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father to all, who is over all and through all and in all. What he's saying is that there is one baptism for all of us as an outward expression. And so I know that naturally brings up the question that George just mentioned. So what about babies that get baptized? And although that's a noble thing for parents to do, it's a sweet, gesture that's probably rooted in tradition more than anything else the reality is that babies cannot repent of their sin babies can't just get up and start following jesus and reading their bible and just becoming disciples of christ because they're babies they don't have an option to and babies don't know the difference between feeling bad about something and actually turning away from their sin. And the reality is that it's a very important thing to repent of your sin in order to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Babies can't confess anything. So although it's traditional, and I know it's noble of parents to want to do that, it's biblically inconsistent. There was a Bible verse that scared me. And I want to get your guys' opinion on this. There was a Bible verse that scared me more than anything. Like, I asked her, I would walk around this neighborhood crying because I was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die forever <laughs> because of this Bible verse. And it was the Bible verse uh, that goes, many will come to God and say, have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not casted out demons in your name? Have I not done this and this and this? And God looks at these people that did his work and says, be away from me. I never knew you. Forever. Mm. And in my mind, I go, well, these people dedicated their life to him. And they're like, see ya. Who am I, a man who just goes on YouTube and talks about God, sins every day. I, I'm sitting next to my girlfriend and we're not married. We fool around Cliff. I'm not proud of it, but we do, we sin. 
So if these guys are doing this and they're being pushed away, then who am I to be even welcomed into the kingdom of God? And a man explained it to me this way. The irony of quoting Matthew 7 as the scariest verse of all time and then simultaneously telling Cliff that him and his girlfriend are living in a sexual immoral relationship is jarring to say the least. So this is for my young men and my young women out there, or even just men and women who are single and they're living their best life or so they think, and they're test driving every car before they buy it. Listen, sexual immorality will destroy your life. You're giving pieces of yourself away to people that you cannot get back. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 highlights this reality very well. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So Paul is telling us like, hey, if you believe in Christ Jesus and you've given your life to him, you're not your own. God paid for you on the cross. He gave his life for you. So why would you sin against your own body knowing that it's the temple of the Holy Spirit? And that is crazy convicting. Now, we all fall short of the glory of God. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I was a perfect person before I met my incredible, beautiful wife. But the reality is that it did damage to my soul. So even for the people who are engaged to be married, I've met people that are engaged for years to be married. You're still not married, still not in a covenant relationship. No matter how many kids you have together, no matter what, you guys are not married. You're not legally binded. And Paul gives us instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and he says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So even if you're engaged to be married, just tie the knot, go to the courthouse, get those papers signed, and then have your destination wedding out in the boondocks, wherever you want to go, but get married. It's better for you. And here's the truth. If you like them enough to have sex with them, then you need to love them enough to get married. My sins and the good deeds that I do are not the measurement of what brings me into heaven. Correct. It's solely off the fact that I believe in a God that outweighs my sins. Amen. Is this wrong for me to believe? Or is it that you have to get baptized? You have to do all of these things. What is it in your point of view that brings a man into heaven? This is really becoming like a trend in these videos. Everybody asks the same question, and it's a noble question to ask, and it's an important question to answer, but I feel like I've answered it in every video, and I'm going to answer it again. What brings us into heaven? What gives us eternal life? Let's go to Romans chapter 10, and it tells us, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Our faith in Jesus is what saves us. It's not the works that we do. We've discussed this before. It's not going to sell everything. It's not being charitable. It's not becoming a better person. It's not cleaning yourself up before you go to church. That doesn't save us. It's faith alone in Jesus Christ. Again, Romans 3.28 says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works, from the law. In other words, it's not what you do that saves you, it's what Jesus did for you on the cross that ultimately saves us and our acceptance of that. In fact, this is a pretty big debate among a lot of different Christian denominations. Are you saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ or are you saved by the works that you do or is it a mixture of both? And Paul so incredibly addresses this exact thing in his letter to the church at Galatia, the Galatians in chapter three, where he says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, was it you that got faith for yourself or was it Jesus that got faith for for you. Faith was a gift. So what are you boasting about? You didn't do anything to earn this. It was by faith in Jesus that you're saved to begin with. As someone so eloquently and kindly put it in the comments the other day, faith without works is dead. Go study your Bible. And for a moment, I froze and I sat there and I started withering away because of this YouTube 
comment and then I realized that he didn't read the entire chapter when he quoted James chapter 2. But the reality is that James chapter 2 is so beautifully intertwined with justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ and here's why. It says this, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from works and I will show you my faith by my works. And then the chapter goes on to explain the faith that Abraham had that God granted to him as righteousness. When Paul's talking about justification by faith alone in Jesus Christ, he talks about Abraham's faith in chapter 15 of Genesis, that Abraham believed and it was granted to him as righteousness. Then James follows up with Abraham's story in, in Genesis 22, where he is going to sacrifice Isaac as part of his faith. Here's the deal. Paul was concerned with the root of faith our foundation of faith. James is concerned with the fruit of our faith, that which is visible based on the invisible faith that we have in Jesus. So it's not a matter of if works saves us, it's that a saving faith has good works and that you'll know people that they're saved by the works that they do. That there's a lot of charities out there that have no idea who Jesus is, they don't care about Jesus, and they do good things. But then there's a lot of Christian organizations or Christians in general that do good things out of the faith they have in their hearts that produces good works in them, and it manifests as doing good works for other people. So what James is saying is, hey, if you have real faith, you will have real works. And what James is referring to is what theologians called progressive sanctification. In other words, that the way that God continues to conform you into the image of Jesus is by producing fruit in you that manifests as good works. So yes, faith without works is dead. I agree. I read that verse, but I also read the chapter. Thanks for hanging out with me as we unpack the biblical insights in the conversation between George and Cliff. And I pray that this video helps you take more steps to follow Jesus in your everyday life because it's not about knowing more. It's about practically using what you know to follow Jesus well. And remember, friends, keep it biblical, and I'll see you in the next one.